I've been asked to speak about the reasons why we took the case and what were the legal arguments that were involved. Now, it may sound like a very simple question, but uh, it's not. It's actually quite complex, um, primarily because you're dealing with an issue of constitutional law. That is one of the most politicised areas of law that you'll ever find. So, I go back to originally, we're talking about citizens, not subjects, and on the other hand, we talk about neoconservatism. Two concepts here. They do not match. Neoconservatives do not want citizens, they want subjects. People who conform. And they've had their best opportunity to do that through their version of lawfare with the, uh, the terrorism laws. And as you know, 10, 12, I don't know how many pieces of legislation they've managed to get through, through Parliament for the last 15 years, which in short have created initially a two-tier justice system where the, the, lev the chances of getting justice for Muslims has been reduced significantly. And uh, if anybody wants to discuss that further, because I've only got a few minutes, I can give that uh, explanation as well later. But that's what they've been doing under the cover of this war on terror. Because neoconservatives are the architects of the war on terror. They want a new world order. And that new world order must involve a strong state with compliant citizens. Now, you bring in CAGE into that. CAGE is supposedly a marginalized fringe Muslim organization. But unfortunately for them, CAGE has gone far beyond that. Despite their smears, CAGE now stands the number one organization which was standing against the whole concept of prevent, has been consistent in exposing the rhetoric and the tactics of these neoconservatives, these people who have been apologizing for the war on terror, people who apologize for torture. These are the people that CAGE has been in battle with since it started. So, you know, a court case is not a total surprise, it had to happen. But as you know, those who were to be close to Cage, um, and some very senior people, very experienced people <coughs> close to Cage, are advising them and say, look, going to court is not an easy thing to do, and one should avoid it as much as possible. What you're really doing is you're forcing the senior judiciary to make a ruling that essentially tells the Prime Minister that he's wrong, that George Osborne who works closely with Michael Gove, who works closely with William Shawcross, that what they are doing in trying to destroy Muslim civil society is wrong, it's outside the law, it's against British values. Those are the background, and so that's the decision that had to be made whether we should go to court or not. Uh, we were helped uh, considerably by the Jersey Roundtree Trust um, because when they made an announcement in March, they actually said, due to intense regulatory pressure, we've had to give an assurance that we will never work with CAGE again. Now, any of you with a very basic understanding of law, administrative law, will know that that is far and beyond the powers of anybody. You cannot force a civil society member, a charity, a trustee, to do as you're, as you're told. What, you do, what you're really supposed to do is let them do what they want to do. If they get it wrong, there'll be consequences. It works that way. But this is a desperation of William Shawcross and a little motley crew of Skiritats who are now taking over Charity Commission. The reason why they took over Charity Commission is quite clear. Their motto has always been, is hot war in Islam abroad, a cold war in Islam here. Well, you know what the hot war is, and the people of Iraq are still suffering from that. But the cold war is, destroy Muslim civil society. Now, on the one hand, we have prime ministers and politicians playing platitudes about how important it is for Muslims to integrate and fit into Britain and <coughs> Europe. And here we are, one of the highest net contributors to the charity sector, enormous amount of involvement, whether it's Lewisham, whether it's small towns around the country, through your masjid, th to your local community, whether it's food banks, whether it's working with the interfaith groups, whether they're working with other kinds of help. Muslims are making a massive contribution and getting through and engaging with non-Muslims out there. Yet we have a narrative that has been keep being imposed that Muslims cannot fit into British or European civil society. This is the background and this is the reason why they have to keep smearing people, why they have to keep going after people. And I suppose I have to say up till now they've been fairly successful because nobody has had the courage to stand up to them. Nobody took a stand against them because, you know, resources, you know, 
other factors involved. And the worst thing is, the worst thing is that no non-Muslim charity or the civil society actors even had the courage to take on William Shawcross and his motley crew. Because that's how much influence, how much they have gone into the public sector, how much they have scared the hell out of all these actors, all these intelligentsia, say, look, you know what? You better do as you're told. That's the context in which these new conservatives were operating. But, of course, as you know, a cage, the motto is, we are citizens, not subjects. Therefore, we had no choice. Cage had no choice. Well, we're going to stand up. It could mean Cage being sort of clobbered with tens of thousands of pounds in uh, legal costs. It could mean judges making some remarks about Cage that will be used left, right, centre. But the, nevertheless, the climate was such, the situation was such, that William Shawcross and the Charity Commission had to be challenged. Um, as I said, anybody who knows this area of law will say that the law and the evidence, uh, you may have seen some of the emails, how they're going on. The law and the evidence was predominantly in favour of Cage. So it wasn't a sort of a big risk, but a risk was still taken that going to court, you don't know how it works, the Prime Minister's against you, the whole establishment sort of doesn't like Cage. It's very difficult for a very senior judge, no matter how independent, I'm sure they're very independent, it's very difficult for them to actually make a stance, make a ruling that would basically in Morrison's words, would stick two fingers at a prime minister. So, <laughs> so, so I think it's, 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 it's you know, Morrison understands their problem. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> so, Churchill is salute, sorry. <laughs> so, that's the reality. But nevertheless, the, the law was so clear, and as soon as we went into court, the judge said, looked at the two points that we broke down. One was that Charity Commission had acted outside its powers, and the other point was that this whole thing about reputational damage that Charity Commission keeps using essentially means that a charity cannot work with an unpopular cause. So if the Sun or the Mail doesn't like a cause, a charity must not work with it. I mean, that's clearly wrong. It goes against the whole concept of charity. I mean, it's only unpopular people, marginalised people who need charity. People who are not unpopular, people who are not marginalised, they don't need charity, they can get on with it. So the whole concept they tried, these neoconservatives were trying to bend over backward to impose on the charities not to work with Cage. And that's why I thought we had to be challenged. I'll be one minute, very quickly. So when we went to court, the judge said, the judge wasn't particularly keen. And we talk about the number one judge in the country, Lord Justice Thomas, bless him, lovely judge. Um, the first thing he said was, this is for Parliament. This is not for court review, which is a, came as a very surprise to those of us who read about, a little bit about separation of powers, where a court is supposed to hold a government to account. And that was the one you know, reason why you go for review. But nevertheless, there was a clear <coughs> indication from the judge. He said, look, I don't want to rule on this. The point is, you guys sort this out. And to his credit, he put enormous amount of pressure on the Charity Commission, telling them how absurd their position was, how draconian the line they'd taken. And that's why, if you look at the final order, it actually says, they mentioned Cage, that Charity Commission never had the power to do what they did. So whatever spin the Charity Commission may put on you now, right? And incidentally, they had one of the uh, Tory spin doctors allocated, seconded to these people shortly before this case, so that all the spinning, all the briefing to the media could go ahead. But even his spinning didn't work. The truth of the matter is we have a draft court order which forced William Shawcross, who thought he was untouchable because nobody had dared to challenge him, to say, actually, you're right, I have no power to force any charity not to work with Cage indefinitely. So that's what we're dealing with. That's the neoconservative attempt that was made. And inshallah, Cage, acting under that, that motto, that you're citizens, not subjects, stood up to it. Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, Cage was successful. And well done to Cage.